Welcome to this session. I think it's going to be really interesting and really relevant to what's going on ac across the world, uh, you know, especially in the last couple of years. I'm honored to be joined today by our panel, uh, Bob Crow, the Director of Emergency Response and Crisis Management at Amerisource Bergen, uh, George Gianji, the Chair of Business, Industry and Infrastructure of South Central Pennsylvania Task Force, and Kent Kettle, the Managing Director of Information Security Office at Reprivita. And the, all these, all three of them are doing great work. Uh, trying to mitigate and respond and, and recover from these types of incidents. Uh, cyber crimes are occurring more and more often, and uh, it's very difficult to determine their cause and their impact and recover from them uh, if they impact your job or your organization. The real question is, how do you even report cyber incidents in a secure and standardized way to both government and private sector entities so that they can uh, render assistance, whether it's an investigation or in recovery. Um, our panel today is going to talk about their experiences in that. And also, we want to know how you've experienced uh, these types of incidents. So uh, Laura is going to be conducting a poll of the audience, and she's going to talk us through how she's going to do that and how uh, you're going to be able to see the results. Thank you so much, Chris. Okay, on your screen, you should see our first poll. Has your agency or firm experienced a cyber attack in the past two years? Yes or no? Okay, if you could take a minute to fill out the poll, we'll close it in just a few seconds. All right. So it looks like 67% have said yes, and 33% have not experienced a cyber attack. That's actually a little frightening. <laughs> um, all right, let's go to our second poll. I'm gonna launch it now. All right, what are your top reasons for your organization to not disclose a cyber attack? And I, you can pick more than one here. All right, we'll just give this about 10 more seconds and we'll close this poll. All right, just a few more seconds. All right, let's take a look. All right, so the people picked uh, brand reputation and lack of trust of government. And then finally for our third poll, one more question, you'll see it on your screen now. Would you be more willing to disclose a cyber attack if the information you provide is redacted to exclude your identity? Yes or no? All right, our third poll is up now, just a few more seconds. All right, Chris, so we have 67% said they would be more willing and 33% said no. All right, Chris, back to you. Thanks, Laura. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bob Crow from Amerisource Bergen. Uh, and Bob's going to talk about um, how the how, what is this problem in the way that he's seen it and experienced it uh, in his work uh, there at uh, AB. Bob, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me let me first preface. I, I'm coming at this from an operational perspective. I, I am not an IT security professional, but uh, I, I manage our, our business from, from that bridge between the the IT security team and and the rest of the business uh, from from a crisis perspective, and then then from a response perspective. So um, it it is something that that we are seeing more frequently in the last uh, two years or so. And um, we have recently experienced uh, a cyber attack here at Amerisource Bergen. Um, we do have a very good uh, defense. Uh, we have an outstanding IT security team. Um, the attack was, was uh, identified early on uh, and was the team mitigated that attack and, and was able to uh, really 
uh, prevent some some real serious damage. Although uh, from what we did experience throughout throughout that attack, um, it's again started slowly um, and then continued to progress throughout all all of the business units. Amerisource Bergen is made up of about twenty eight different business units, um, and they're all linked. Uh, we're all linked together uh, in one way or another. So um, it was something that, that started out uh, almost uh, to the point where it was not, not really noticed. Uh, it, it looked like just a, an average incident that uh, had occurred in one of the business units and, and continued on. Uh, the IT team jumped in, started to mitigate that incident and realized what was going on uh, and was able then to uh, bring the business down, shut everything down. Uh, and then take us over to a backup system and bring everything back up and get us back up and running within a day. So it was very impressive as, as to what that, that team was able to do uh, because they were prepared. Um, they were prepared for this. They, they trained for this and, and they had the systems and uh, such in place uh, to prevent the, any real serious damage uh, to Amerisource Bergen, which uh, our, our hats off to them. Um, but what from an operational perspective, um, it, it is very, we see it, it's very confusing at first as to what's going on. It, it in many cases, it, it appears as a simple issue or a, a simple ticket to, to the help desk. Um, and then, uh, you know, waiting for that issue to get rectified. And, and then before you know it, we have a full blown attack going on. So the challenge from, from the operational perspective is, is, internally, and, and this isn't even, you know, going to the external portion, is to get that communication out to the business, let the business know what's going on as soon as possible, and, and what the business can expect uh, from that. And then that leads on to other things. And I know we're going to get a little bit deeper into uh, why and how and why not, uh, why we don't communicate out or um, why we're a little hesitant to communicate out. But uh, with, with having the opportunity to identify uh, what the issue is and then be able to clearly communicate that out, um, it is a challenge. Uh, the business wants to know what's going on. Uh, every second uh, that goes by is, is important. So um, getting out ahead of that is, is key. And, and I think that the, our IT team here does a very good job of that. And they're able to to get that out, and then we can get the business make make the business aware, and then respond appropriately. Um, and like I say, Chris, I, I'll get into a little bit deeper as to you know how we communicate and and um, in in what ways we communicate these issues and why uh, in in our next uh, in our next segment. Thanks, Bob. Uh, that's uh, that's great insight and. Uh... It's, uh, it's really interesting that you guys have had an actual real world, world experience there recently. I'm, I'm sure there were a lot of lessons learned and, and after actions that you went through uh, with that. Um, Kent, how about you? I know you're doing a lot of work in trying to protect people from, from these types of uh, scenarios as well. You're muted, Kent. Thank you. Uh, my perspective goes way back to any time we're trying to piece together information. Uh, we don't want to lose time or be interrupted by not knowing which information came from where and how it's being pieced together. Not that we always need to know the source, but is this bit of information new? Is it old? Is it repeatable? Um, how do we tie that together? So I decided to join the team to uh, be part of creating the alerting standard uh, from the perspective that I had lived on the other end of, of trying to make sense of data two, three, four weeks out. And it was not always clear that that announcement on day one, uh, which uh, line of uh, criticality that one went to. So I've got some perspectives on how to do that, as well as uh, to keep the information secure, uh, keep it anonymous. And uh, what we'd like to do is share it in such a way that uh, people feel protected and their, their information is protected because it's anonymized. And we're going to request the information 
for the alerting standard in such a way that uh, their their business is protected too. Uh, what if somebody made a mistake and they uh, said that there is a an attack going on, but it happened to be a, a network change that lasted longer than some people expected, or uh, maybe a hiccup on a server, and maybe it wasn't an attack at all. We don't want people to uh, lose face or market share or have anything else go awry if there was a mistake. So uh, things will be anonymized, uh, but helpful. And so that'll take some iterative uh, processes to create the standard and the approach for people to share information freely and also uh, be signed up to get that information from the alerting standard. So we're gonna talk more about this in detail uh, later, but that's uh, why I chose to get involved. Thanks, Kent. And uh, well, I know we all appreciate that you did get involved. So uh, it's been it's great working with you. George? Great. Thanks, Chris. Let me uh, see if I can share my screen. Okay, you should all uh, be able to see the cyber alerting process, hopefully. Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, as Chris mentioned, and, and Bob and Kent, you know, my role is uh, I, as the chair of the business and industry and infrastructure group with the South Central PA task force, I've got over a 1000 members, uh, some of which are private, the majority of private sector and non government organizations, as well as government organizations. And, you know, I was the one that kind of uh, brought this up to, uh, to, to Tom uh, Moran uh, to look into uh, why the a, uh, AHC, the All Hazards Consortium, they're really positioned in, in, in such a manner that uh, they reach out to a number of businesses, large businesses and, and mom and pop businesses, but they also have a great conduit to, uh, to the government, in this case, CISA or DHS. Uh, so it was, it was really a natural uh, uh, potential for AHC to kind of get that, uh, get that ball rolling. So th this is just a, a snapshot and a preacher of the choir, I'm sure, but there's billions of dollars that are spent uh, every year on, on cyber crimes. Uh, and this came from uh, the FBI uh, IC3 uh, report. So the potential cyber vulnerabilities, obviously it runs the gamut. Uh, phishing, business email compromises, uh, data breach, ransomware obviously has been, uh, it, it's taken on a whole new business model recently. I mean, ransomware, some of these perpetrators are actually going out and, and soliciting uh, people from your organization to assist and, and share in some of the profits, believe it or not, in the ransom that uh, ends up getting paid. So as an IT manager, if you can put your, yourself in this situation, you hear about a company that experienced a major cyber attack. You're obviously George, looking- um, it's Laura. You're, can you, your slides are not advancing. Do you wanna try go to slideshow? Okay, I thought I was in slideshow. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, did it not advance, uh, Laura? No, it's just on the main, the first number one, slide number one. Okay. There you go. But you're um, not in slideshow format. Okay, and that's fine though, but, but you're seeing- Yeah, it? that's fine. Okay, that's, let's, that's let, me leave, let me leave it here. So as an IT manager, you hear about a, a cyber attack. You know, it, it's all the buzz, yeah, it's social media, whatever, somebody calls you, you want more information, but all you get is, is blogs and social media posts and news media reports. Can you really trust the information as Kent mentioned? How did the malware get introduced? Are you vulnerable to a similar attack? Uh, have you already been affected? You know, can we get a trusted source and, and, and to put this information out in a timely manner? And that really is the is the challenge. So 85% of our critical infrastructure in the United States are either privately owned or operated. They're bottom line oriented, answering obviously to customers, to shareholders, uh, to their board of directors. 
So it's really paramount that they get uh, trusted information in a timely fashion. And the reluctance to disclose a cyber attack, I think the poll that Laura put out kind of illustrates this. Uh, there's either the harm to brand name, there's the erosion of public trust. If you go to a government source and provide them that information, how do you know that that's not going to go public and, and hurt, your, uh, hurt your company name? And certainly there's a liability issue. You know, you're going to get your legal advisors to, to steer you in one way or, or another. So the cyber attacks impact on the security and safety. With information technology, obviously, there's a loss of potential of data. Operational technology controls equipment. You know, whether you're a water plant or, or a manufacturer, uh, if you have industrial, industrial control systems, uh, programmable logical controllers, or the SCADA systems that, uh, that, that are maneuvered or remotely uh, taken on by a perpetrator, that delay in notification uh, of, of the cyber attack uh, can result in further release of data or even more dangerously impact essential uh, services like introduce additional or, or lack of chlorine to a water uh, facility. So what details really are needed? Do we really need to know the name of the victim's organization? Or do we really know, need to know the victim organization didn't update their system or were lacking in certain areas? I would contend that that really is not the case. What you really want is the pertinent information, uh, such as what did the malware look like? How was it introduced? Uh, is there a certain file or maybe an email that that I should let my employees know to avoid? Uh, was it a security patch uh, gone rogue or disguised as a, as a security patch? So all of these types of questions is really what, what we're after. Uh, and I think you can accomplish that without letting it be known uh, about the specifics with respect to the name of the company and, and did, they, did they lack certain uh, hygiene in cyber uh, areas? Uh, and, and that's really what we're hoping to, to get out of this uh, use case. So what details are needed? Uh, well, again, I would contend that you're really looking at, at this, type of, uh, this type of information. Okay, is there a central collection point? Could there be a central collection point for cyber attacks? A trusted source of cyber attack information could be redacted to protect a victim. And the notification then is distributed in a, in a timely manner. Now, obviously, there's a number of, uh, of trusted sources that we use on a daily basis. Uh, CISA, uh, US CERT, FBI, IC3. You may be part of an ISAC in, in the IT uh, sector. Uh, certainly, there's Fusion Center. Uh, I think one of our other speakers is going to be talking a little bit about, about that. There's uh, organizations like InfraGuard. Uh, so that's the kind of, uh, hopefully, if we can put our arms around the problem, uh, we might be able, as a, as a partnership between public and private sector, uh, be able to solve this, uh, solve this challenge. Uh, Chris, I'll turn it over uh, to you. Thanks, George. That's, uh, that's great information and a really great way of, of framing uh, the problem. So now, what is this group and others in the All Hazards Consortium doing to try and, uh, and solve this problem? Well, um, there is a, uh, a methodology uh, to this that they, we use at the AHC, uh, the use case methodology. And we use that to actually make sure that the problem is well-defined, uh, that the right stakeholders are there, that the impacts are well understood across multiple uh, markets, multiple domains, uh, multiple impacts. Um, bring the right people together to gain consensus on who the stakeholders are, who are the decision makers are, and get them involved in the conversation. Um, and then what is the information that needs? And you saw some of that in George's presentation, and I know our panelists are going to go into that in detail in the second half of this presentation. Um, and what, how does that information need to be reported, aggregated, presented, and acted upon to solve the problem? Understanding the sensitivity of that information um, and applying solutions to that, this is where many of these initiatives uh, that, that don't follow this process stop. Uh, when, when security gets involved, when proprietary information gets involved, when 
when sensitive information that has uh, may or may not have a classification associated with it gets involved, the, uh, the iteration tends to stop. This use case methodology is designed to overcome some of those obstacles by gaining consensus on, on the classification or the uh, distribution of information and ways to share it and to visualize it that uh, hold those tenants of, of sensitive information true and, and, and are, are supportive of the need to uh, protect the information. So we're gonna, I'm gonna hand it back over to our panel. We're gonna stop, start again with Bob uh, and he's working through this process uh, with AHC and he's gonna talk about uh, his experience and how he feels like this could help solve the, the challenges that he's facing. Bob, back uh, over to you. Thanks, Chris. And it, it, it is an issue. It's, it's, it's a huge issue that, that we need, need to work through. Um, thinking about our organization, we, we're in healthcare distribution. Um, here in the United States, we're, Amerisource Bergen is part of what is, is known as one of is the big three. <clears throat> our, ourselves and, and two, uh, two other large companies here in the United States, we we do most, I'd say about 80, about almost 90% of, uh, not quite 90% of all healthcare distribution here in the United States. Um, we, in one way or another, we do business with one, one out of every two hospitals across the United States. So, you know, getting, getting uh, hit by a cyber attack and, and not being able to, to do business at, at that level, um, not only is it you know, devastating for us as a company, but again, downstream to our customers and then ultimately to patients. Uh, and, and the way that the way the system is set up, it, it's not so simple that, well, if, if one, one is out, the other two can pick up the slack. That, that's not the case. They, they are not capable, they're not set up to do that, nor are we set up to pick up their slack. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that, that go on across the supply chain. So you can imagine that, you know, when this, this type of news um, or this, this incident hits the news, you know, you have that, I'm not going to say panic, but, but what, potential, uh, what potential response could, could be caused and that ripple effect across the way. And we, we saw it with the Colonial Pipeline, uh, you know, when, when, that, when that happened, you know, all of a sudden it's like, you know, uh, mile long lines at the gas stations. But in this case, we're talking about we're talking about pharmaceuticals and, and other healthcare products. So um, that look, looking at, at that, so we have to figure out a way to, to be able to, to get this information out and, and get a response, proper response um, so we can not only save ourselves, I'm um, being a little selfish here, but let's be honest, we're a business and we're here for, for a reason, um, but yet to, to also continue the supply chain and protect the, protect the healthcare supply chain. So it, it's a must. It, it, it's a must. It's a conversation that I think everybody knows we have to have. Um, it's a conversation that I know has been started on multiple occasions, but we, we run into that first brick wall and, and it kind of, that's where the conversation kind of falls off. So, you know, the, this, this conversation and, and other work that the uh, AHC is doing around this, I think is vital uh, to, to the supply chain. Thanks, Bob. I uh, I can say as a consumer that uh, major disruption to the pharmaceutical supply chain and healthcare supply chain I find absolutely terrifying, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think that um, you know the, the Colonial Pipeline situation definitely shown a light on the the asymmetrical impact of some of these types of attacks. But when you when you move and extrapolate that into into healthcare, boy, that that that's scary. That's very scary. So, um, thank you for uh, for your work on that. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll have some questions for you at, at the end. So, thanks, Kent. How about you? Well, the uh, the approach that I see that's needed, and and it ought to be helpful to 
any of the uh, industry partners that have signed up and they're part of the process would be that these cyber incidents uh, trigger events uh, that evolve into operational disruptions. And when that happens, we need an approach that uh, helps anybody that's getting that alert know, is this gonna affect me? How, how is this progressing? Is it progressing in a way that I need to do something or what can I look for? Can I look for IP addresses? Is this operational technology or information technology? Uh, did it come from the outside? Did it come from the inside? Uh, what can I do? So the alert needs to be at an operational level to help uh, the receivers know. And then there's the obstacles that would impede sharing. How do we allow the information to be shared uh, in a way that the person that just got hacked can actually even share it? So we need to have it such that if their internet is down and they don't have access to the internet, how could they still share the information? And so we need an alerting system that can uh, be accessed in multiple ways, even if they don't have access to the internet, they might be able to uh, add the information by their phone or some other method. Uh, and then uh, processes that are used to share and report that uh, information we need it to be uh, standardized in such a way that people fight like they train. So we're gonna have opportunity to train and have uh, scenarios where people could practice and then determine, well, was this information useful or do we need to add something more for me to do something with it? And so those are three thoughts on uh, an approach that we could use. And then uh, affirming with the uh, sharing entities, those organizations, that their information is protected. So Chris, you've got methods uh, and that we know about to protect that information, to keep the shared information secure as people log into a special place to share that. And then the risk level. Uh, if people are really busy and they already have things going on, they need to understand what the risk is that this could expand to affect them. And so that's a, a method to gain attention, but yet not grow into some sort of fatigue. Oh dear, I got another alert. What am I gonna do with that? So uh, there's gonna be some risk level attached to these. And then of course they will be anonymous, uh, but available and eventually uh, it might, be well understood that how this happened and who it was related to. But most of the time, these happen to multiple organizations. So uh, people probably won't be able to, to walk back in peace when it happened to who. Uh, it, but we want to purposefully make it so that it doesn't go like that, so that people aren't uh, only doing this for the sake of um, ideas and reasons other than IT. So those are um, some perspectives that I think are useful as we move forward. And thank you. Thanks, Kent. That is uh, that's very interesting. Uh, um, I think uh, I'll have a follow-up question for, for all of you uh, at the end of this, if we have time. Um, alert fatigue is something I think that is uh, uh, something that I'd, I'd love to hear how you, you three uh, see that happening and how you would manage it in your organization. George, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Just to segue on what, what Bob and Kent uh, talked about, you know, like the colonial pipeline situation, where as a result of that, the consequence was uh, TSA stepped up essentially and imposed uh, required notifications on their industry. Uh, and, and they're in a position where, where they could do that. Uh, what I would like come out of this use case is if we can establish a, a conduit that's trusted and that could put out that information in a timely manner, uh, I think that would, be, that would be terrific. I mean, right now we're at the mercy of uh, either scuttlebutt, you know, you hear about a certain malware 
and and you 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 off chasing your tail essentially uh and maybe prioritizing uh patches uh, that may or may not have the right level of priority uh, and if your company or organization is attacked and you're sitting on that information uh, for fear of liability and and, and other issues uh, obviously the litigation potential is is great you know the the question that lawyers typically ask is did you know or should you have known uh, and lacking that notification and public disclosure could cost you dearly in the long run. Uh, so again, if we if we have a specific uh, protocol where we would notify a certain organization and, and trust that that information is going to be redacted, you at least have done your, your due diligence. You've provided the country essentially with with uh, the proper information without necessarily disclosing uh, proprietary or, or, or sensitive information about your company. Uh, I think that's really the best, the best of both worlds. And, and depending on what kind of product uh, or service you provide as a result of your business operations, that could be devastating if, if that's delayed and, and consequentially uh, that results in uh, harm to the public, uh, or the loss of data uh, from your customers, from your employees, intellectual property. So really to have something in place to provide timely trusted information is, is really something that uh, we hope to achieve. And, and really the, the, the last part of the today's session is, is looking for your input. What would you like to see? How would you like to see it structured? What do you see the challenges being and how can we overcome some of those challenges? Chris? Thank, thanks, George. Um, I, I'm really, I really uh, like that you brought the legal aspect into this because it is always a, a factor that as operators, we, we get too late. <laughs> um, Bob, it, it, you know, if all this is in place and people are, are, fine, are reporting incidents, um, uh, and to a centralized, uh, centralized ish environment, and those those alerts are then are able to be shared out. How would you? What would you do with that information coming into Amerisource Bergen? Uh, if you were to see, would it be too noisy? Would you? How would you turn that into something actionable? Would it be too noisy? Um, I, I would say no. It's it would not be too noisy. Getting getting six or seven alerts on the same thing, um, you know, that then becomes a bit uh, a bit noisy. Not even noisy. It just becomes difficult to 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 deal with. But um, if if I may, one uh, just if I could just Chris just tag one thing on to, to what George was saying, and and really I think it does fit here. Speed is another issue. Um, I, I think ultimately we do, I, I like what's going on at CISA and, and you know, I, I like what's going on out there, but I think speed sometimes, you know, in, in this area is, is important and it's something that uh, I know we're talking about getting the right information, absolutely, and, and getting it to the right people, absolutely, but getting it to them quickly. Because once one company has been attacked, every, every moment that goes by, everybody is, remains vulnerable until... That information is shared, and you know the appropriate actions can be taken. But um, you know, in 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 our in in my world here at Amerisource Bergen, we're we're getting that information into our global watch center, um, and then we're ass assessing that information, and then we're getting that out to that IT team, and letting them really dive into that and determine, um, you know, how, how useful that that bit of information is, and then it, as it comes back uh, to us, they'll they'll let us know. Uh, what is use, what is useful, not so much what is useful, but what is not useful to them. And then we adjust our, uh, our distribution of that information. So we're trying to collect as much as we can to get it into the hands of the people that uh, are, are fighting this war and then uh, taking their, their responses and their actions back and, and trying to mitigate any of that noise, as you say. You know, the, I, I, the speed situ the speed uh, point, I think, is well taken, you know, to make actionable information. One definition I heard is that it had to be accurate and timely. 
uh, in order to be able to take action on it. So Bob, your point about getting the information uh, fast enough, but you you have the opportunity to do something with it is, is something that I think we need to get better at. Uh, Kent, um, kind of dovetailing off of what Bob said, uh, how, do you have any ideas on how uh, information about uh, cyber incidents could be, how that delivery could be sped up, even if maybe it means not necessarily being 100% thoroughly uh, vetted before it's distributed? Well, if if there was a type of uh, dashboard or a panel that people could be pointed to, where when they log in, they can see the types of alerts that have come in and the categories that uh, relate to them, uh, it would help them uh, in that environment, of, you know, the information sharing environment, uh, be able to understand uh, what type of um, event is happening. And, and I don't know if you can see my screen. Um, is that, oh, here it is, Cher. Um, so what I wanted to do is, is uh, point out these um, options here. And is that, it almost looks like the, uh, there, let's put that down. Um, so these are some things that could be shared and seen in that uh, dashboard area of uh, how the event is scoped. And um, these are some questions that people might have uh, as they try to do some high level forensics to see, is it likely that this could happen to me? Uh, what can I look for? Um, so we want to touch on symptoms, the impact, the effects. Uh, is there likely to be a crisis? Are there footprints that I can use to, to find out if it's happening to me? Um, could it spread? Uh, did I lose information? Uh, from Is it from the outside? Uh, so these are some questions that we hope to answer and make visible uh, for those that are uh, looking to learn and, and gain and protect their own systems. That's a, that's a great list and I appreciate you showing that. That got, will be captured in the recording for people to go back and, and look at. George, uh, you know, kind of as we keep going down this this thread, and and you see that list of of criteria, and uh, and as we say in the uh, in the geospatial world, uh, 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 you know, list of data that uh, Kent uh, talked about. What are your thoughts uh, on that? And have you seen anybody who is who is moving this ball forward in the the timely and accurate re reporting of cyber incidents? And Kent, being in the geospatial business myself, I loved your dashboard reference. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, Chris, that that's a great question. And really, right now, as as IT professionals hear about something, a malware, uh, they're going to seek out what they consider to be trusted sources. You know, that may be Krebs on security, that may be IT, ISAC, uh, knowbefore.com, uh, uh, blogs. Uh, and, and it's really searching out in hopes of, of corroborating what they heard, as opposed to going to a certain site, whether that be private industry or government, and knowing that, that if it's on that site, that I can pretty much trust that uh, that information is something that's actionable. I can take back to my organization and, and act upon it. Uh, so that really is, is, the, is the final, I think, uh, proof in the pudding, if you will, of what comes out of this use case. If we can accomplish that, I think we'll have done a, a great service uh, to, to this country and, and to the sector that you actually uh, are involved in, and that's that's really what I'm hoping uh, might be uh, might be accomplished at the end of the uh, of, of the use case. Fantastic! Uh, I think we hope so too. Uh, I'm going to give our panelists one last uh, a couple couple minutes each to just to talk about uh, 
how that they're that they give some closing remarks on on their work on this and maybe how the rest of the community can engage and, and help in, in moving some solutions forward. Uh, Bob, uh, would you like to go first? Thanks, Chris. One thing that, that I am seeing though, I'm starting to see states step up in, 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 into this role and, and push this type of information out, um, which is great. Um, the, only, the only thing though that we need to be careful about that, that we're not getting 50 message, same, of the same messages as we spoke of earlier. So, you know, that on top of what the All Hazards Consortium is doing in other areas, you know, getting, getting this, ver this, this angle from the states involved into, into a use case and develop that, that information to a single source or a single place where, where uh, industry and, and uh, business can go to, to get that data instead of having to parse through 50 different, uh, 50 different emails uh, on, on the same subject. So, I, I think we are starting to see some things start start to come together and start to move in that direction. I just think it's a great opportunity, uh, again, like you said, for, for a use case to, to get get those groups involved and, and identify a single a single source, whether it be that a dashboard or whether it be some other place to go to get that information. And then uh, just, just for for anybody on the end, again, from an operational perspective, uh, making sure that that you're you're communicating and that that, that bridge between your your IT if, if you're not an IT or between IT and, and the operations is there and there's communications back and forth because the business needs to communicate to the IT team and the IT team certainly needs to communicate uh, to, to the business internally uh, for that and then going outside of the business uh, you've got that single, You've got that single message, that that single consolid that consolidated message into a single message, and there aren't multiple messages uh, going out from from the same source. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Kent. So I think, and and I believe the question is, uh, what bit of advice could I give? Is that what we saw there in the chat? Yes, and any any other way that people could help uh, you and your work as you try and, and work through a, work to a solution. Here. Right, right. So the um, the usefulness is is we've already addressed, uh, but getting back to uh, the information that's shared, uh, one thing people need to think of if they're going to have. Uh, the ability to go back and look is how much data is being stored uh, that's uh, part of their monitoring system. So I've been involved in several events where we had to go back and look. And uh, five years ago, as the cost of storage was coming down, some organizations didn't realize it and they still uh, had an aversion to store too much data uh, on their network flows. So one organization I was in, uh, we looked back and said, oh boy, at this point, we only have 11 hours worth of data because the data is coming through so fast, we only have a little bit. And so we went and bought some more storage. Uh, so if you're going to do any kind of forensics, you need to be able to, to go back and look or even just say, What's happened in the last 24 hours? Do I have that IP address pinging on my network? Do I have uh, these types of data flows happening now that weren't happening before? Uh, some of that we've seen recently uh, with organizations uh, having data leave their uh, applications and head someplace else. And there are certain triggers and things to look for. But if you're not monitoring, and you don't have a way to look and see what's happening, uh, then it's gonna be harder to fend off the attack. So uh, a good monitoring system with uh, the ability to store sufficient data to do some forensics, uh, a lot of people save six months worth. If you don't have a week's worth, uh, you're probably at risk. So that's my thought. Great and, and really good advice, Kent. George, uh, last but not least. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'd like to leave it with, uh, certainly we don't want to duplicate 
this effort, if, if there's a, a central repository that, that's more conducive to establishing this, this uh, situation, by all means, let's, let's take advantage of it. I think we've all experienced in the last two years what uh, changing information and misinformation because of COVID. Uh, I'd like to see a dashboard where we can go to. It's a one-stop shop. And it lets us all know that this is trusted information and is actionable. As we all are now going through this sensitive uh, situation between Russia and Ukraine, the word is out now that there could be a higher than average uh, potential for uh, cyber attacks uh, from Russia sponsored uh, types of situation. Uh, this emphasizes the need to have a, a certain site where we can all go to for trusted, timely information. And, and this would be a great way to, to kind of catapult into it. Chris? Thanks, George. Uh, yeah, I think that that would be a, a fantastic resource. Well, I'd like to thank the, the panelists. Uh, I know I learned a lot from uh, the three of you and thank you for your work on, on this uh, use cases that's increasing uh, in, in importance. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to Laura and, and she will, uh, she will keep us on uh, schedule and get you on to your next session. Laura? All right, Chris, thank you so much. I'd like to thank Kent, George, Bob, and Chris, you especially for moderating today's session.